Okay, we're back. I'm Jim. I'm here with Dr. Travis Dickinson. Uh, he's the Associate Professor of Philosophy and Christian Apologetics at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Oh, it's mouthful. Though. I know. <laughs> you, you don't want to know how long it took me to try to memorize that. Um, and you are the author. The one we're doing tonight is Stand Firm. That's right. But in 2015, you did a book called Everyday Apologetics as well. So author of both those books. Um, we're about to start part two. We're just right now in the middle of a break at the Atheist and Christian Book Club. And you'll see those in their entirety in our library as well. So be looking for those. In fact, this will be the, the lead up to part two. Um, my question for you, Travis, is the question that we at Atheist Edge ask every guest that comes on, whether you're a Christian or a, um, a non-believer. Um, I, I have to, of course, tailor the question depending on what you are. Mm -hmm. So here's the question. If there were conclusive evidence that no gods existed, the debate is over, we win, you guys lose, there's, there's nothing after this. There's no hope for any, no part of us lives on after death. How would it change your life and what would you do differently? Mm. So <laughs> there's a lot of ways to get at that question. Of course, mm -hmm. it's, I'm sure that it's a purely hypothetical, yeah. right? Um, and I go back, so there's a technical sort of piece to it where, uh, right, whether or not that antecedent, the if, the hypothetical part, could be satisfied. You said, if there's evidence that there's no gods. Um, and for me, the, the only reason I say it that way is just because when it comes to the ontological argument for God's existence, there's a way in which that's a deductive argument for God's existence, making God a necessary being. And so it could be the case that you're asking a question like, what if if it was if there was evidence that two plus three didn't equal five? How would Ooh. you go? So mm -hmm. there's a I, and I and I'm not saying that's my view necessarily, but that's that is one thing that I think about an awful lot, and I've sort of come closer to that view in recent years to say that it might be that God. Uh, I mean, certainly on the Christian view, God is a necessary. You view. came at that with intellectual honesty, but some people could see the way your your re, the, your yeah. reasoning right yeah. now as avoiding the hypothetical. Yeah, and it's not meant to yeah. be an avoiding. Right. So if, if I say, leaving all that aside, okay. and let's say we grant the, the antecedent that there's conclusive right. evidence that there's no God, it would it would change my life quite a lot, uh, especially philosophically, because my views, and this is a, this goes all the way back to a, a philosopher named Alvin Plantinga who sort of oh, yeah. laid this out of saying, Look, if you're a Christian, uh, your belief in the Christian God should be should figure centrally into your philosophical views, and so that's the approach to philosophy that I've taken is to say, this is a hugely uh, 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 theoretically rich notion that impacts all all these different views. So I think it would change all that for sure. Whether or not it would change the way I live my life, I mean, my Sunday mornings would be, you know, a little freer. Uh, a little more sleeping in, maybe. Um, but, you know, I, th I don't think that it would change it beyond my philosophical, theological views of, of the world. Fair enough. Um, th that uh, I, I kind of chuckled because one of our hosts, um, Chris, he does a blog called Sleeping in Sundays. Okay. So yes. there's a little plug, too. It'll be on your screen right now. Okay, so we're going to get back into part two of the Atheist Christian Book Club now and, and speak to uh, Travis a little bit. we got another hour with him with the club, so uh, stay tuned for that. Thanks a lot Thanks for coming on. For sure. All right. Well, welcome back to the Atheist and Christian Book Club. We're looking at Stand Firm. We have one of the authors here with us, uh, Dr. Dickinson, and he's going to be sharing with us in a minute. But before we get back to the questions, we've had some good questions, a little bit more machine gun than a normal book club, but maybe this topic brings out the best of everybody here. Uh, so, uh, But before we get back to the questions from everyone, I had a question I'd like to slip in here. What motivated you to write this book, and um, could you tell me that, and also kind of wrap up with uh, kind of uh, summarizing what you began with about what we mean, what you mean by faith? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, the motivation really uh, started with the co-authors and I sitting down and we're planning a conference and that sort of thing. We thought, man, you know this work, we should make a book out of it. So we kind of just did that, but it really became something more. 
Uh, and it's really the, the subtitle that I think talks about what our heart in it is. And, and it, so it's stand firm, apologetics, and the brilliance of the gospel. Uh, we like that word brilliance because what we want to say is that the gospel is not only brilliant in the sense that it's reasonable on our view, uh, but also that it's beautiful. And so we want to, we, we try to throughout the book, we, we do give a heavy dose of the sort of uh, rational side of things, but we try to point at the beauty of this belief. I think it's a good story even if you don't believe it's true. I think the story of Christianity, the story of the gospel, is a good story even if it's not true. I think it's true, but I think it's, it's also beautiful. Um, and coming back to this issue of faith, I, I think I just wanted to make sure it was clear what I'm trying to do when I define the term faith. And when we define any term, uh, especially philosophically, uh, I do epistemology as my primary area of scholarship. And when we define something like, say, knowledge, which this definition was sort of thrown, thrown into the discussion at a certain point, um, I, I say knowledge is something like justified true belief. Are you satisfied those three conditions? You know, leaving out some technical di uh, difficulties, you've got yourself knowledge. Now, it, it won't do for me, it doesn't bother me if someone says, hey, I don't use the term knowledge that way. Or people that have come before you have, have used the term differently than that. Uh, that's okay. I, I'm giving you an account of knowledge, uh, and I'm giving, and I'm not, it's not just not terminological, it's philosophical. So I think even if you disagree with my definition of knowledge, I think you will, when you know something, I think you still have a justified true belief, even if you don't hold to that account. In the same way that with faith, I think that all of us in this room, again, are, are expressing faith in a sense by sitting on our chairs. We, we put our faith in our spouses. We put our faith in other people that we know and care about, our friends, and so on. Um, and, and that's what I think accords well with the way in which the Bible talks about faith. There's risk involved. That's the hoped for. That's the unseen. We don't know what the future is. There's definitely risk involved, but it's a kind of relational risk. And so when we, when we look at, say, Hebrews 11.1, 1, we so often just strip that out of its context. But what the, rest of, what the rest of Hebrews 11 does is it gives all these instances that helps clarify the, the characterization that started the chapter, and I think all of those accord well. Uh, you don't see any people just acting uh, completely irrationally at least uh, it, within the narrative. So you have guys like Abraham uh, that, that had, it, had the direct experience with God. And again, you might not believe the narrative, but in the narrative, he had plenty of good reasons to place his faith in God. Right. He did you, it in a rational way. Let me do the one thing before we do that, and just kind of wrap up the <laughs> intro if I could. Uh, uh, and, and one other thing I want to get from you, because you brought it up, and um, just so we get our definitions down and stuff, I think you saw the brilliance, the subtitle, yes. The Brilliance of the Gospel. For those watching on the video, or maybe for some of us, could you kind of just give a, uh, what do you mean when you say gospel? What okay, is the gospel? so I, I mean it in a general sort of sense to, to refer to the Christian story. Uh, and that being uh, that Jesus was more than a mere rabbi, he was more than a rear, uh, mere political zealot, but he was the Son of God, and, and he died on the cross for sins and, and, and defeated death by rising again. Uh, I, I think if you, again, just considering it in its literary value, again, I think that there's a be sort of certain beauty to that itself. Um, and, and anyway, I, I think that's the kind of idea that I'm thinking when I say that's a beautiful sort of story. But you know the scholarship is that Jesus is best viewed as an apocalyptic prophet that thought the world was coming to an end. Remember, he would judge the 12 tribes. His disciples were fighting on who gets to you know, be the sit on your right and left. And you will judge the 12 tribes. It didn't work out. He had a bad weekend in Jerusalem. And in the story, what's so beautiful about Well, that's that? not the story, though, right? Because the story is that he rose from the dead, defeating death, and everything. But you mentioned. know the scholarship is he's Beth Dale Allison, who um, Ken uh, mentioned to us, wrote a book out at University. Who's not a Christian? But Bill, that, doesn't that mitigate against the late gospel? Because if they're fabricating the story a hundred years later, they don't write back what you interpret as a false prophecy that Jesus is well, on Well, I mean, mainstream scholarship says that Mark was was oh, was written in the late 60s, maybe up to early 70s. So you go that early with, with Mark? That's Possibly. the consensus. Yeah, that's the consensus. Yeah. And then Matthew, maybe around 
75. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. You wouldn't agree with those dates. Uh, I don't. You don't? What, no, no. What I, mean, I wouldn't expect them to. Yeah, the, 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 the case, the case for, for why you why would the, the, the gospel Why would you go against the vast consensus and say it's pre-70, the gospels were pre-70? Yeah, because uh, the biggest, one of the, one of the reasons why it gets pushed later um, is because of well, let me, let me go at it the, the other side. The reason to push it earlier is because Acts, for example, doesn't mention the destruction of the temple, which would have, in the destruction of Jerusalem, which would have been a catastrophic, life-changing event. Uh, in fact, Acts, I always say this, especially to Baptists, that Acts is kind of a boring end to it. Right? It just sort of drops off with Paul in, in uh, ha under house arrest and that sort of thing. A perfect sort of big ending would have been the destruction of the temple, or Paul's execution, those sorts of things, and none of those things are mentioned. So the, the thought is, and I find this plausible, that it was written before those events. And then if you take Acts, who's the writer of Acts, that is Luke, uh, or at least minimally you would say that the, the writer of Acts is the same writer of Luke, which pushes Luke before 70 AD. And, it, and then the, the then Mark before. Like, so this, see, this, this is in the end notes of this book, and he dealt with this right here. I'm, I'm looking right here. Uh, the critical scholars often date Mark sometime after 70 AD, but the, there's a bias that forces them to do that because Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. So in their, in their viewpoint, Jesus couldn't have known the future. Therefore, the, the later gospel writers after 70 are writing this prophecy back into yeah, Jesus. Right. Well, you then you it. can't have it both ways. Is it later or is it earlier? Well, I know, let me talk about Joseph. Joseph, um, Luke is ripping off Josephus. Josephus wrote Antiquities in 93 AD. Do we agree on that? Uh, that's something. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, he, he, obviously Luke is written in 85 to 95 because he's ripping off Josephus, right? Well, I, you got to ask me what I agreed with. I, I, mean, <laughs> no, I, I, was, I yeah. was thinking, okay, good. You, yeah. Yeah. No, just, so, he couldn't have, Luke had to have written But, but the problem there with, with that is, is you have Paul, I'm sorry, you have Paul <laughs> quoting Luke as scripture. So that's the point I was trying to raise earlier. Yeah. I was trying to establish that he doesn't follow that what you're just the point you're trying to make. Well, I mean, I, that that would be an argument from silence on your part that he doesn't follow that because he has. No, I just that. asked him. He said he agrees with mainstream scholarship Paul's that Paul earlier. wrote before. But there could be the pieces gospels. of Luke already in certain. But, yeah, that's his. Yeah, he because he wasn't saying that what I'm saying isn't true. What he's saying is is that no, no, no. Paul was potentially before, but uh, it, it very much so. I mean, Paul quotes Luke. It's, it's well. It's I, mean, there. I mean, I mean, you're you're running against the grain of even evangelical mainstream scholarship, not just liberal. But, scholarship. but let me ask you, that. Ken, because I thought you just said that it, that uh, Mark could have been written before seven. Yeah, it could have been written and in the late mainstream. Yeah, yeah, that is true. I just was reading Ehrman the other day, and he that's what his view is. Okay, well then, um, then. Yeah. Then, then you would disagree with Bill, who's saying it has to be written after Josephus. Yes, because the, uh, the, the Roman army was already, the, the war was from 66 to 70, so the handwriting was on the wall that the Jerusalem yeah. was being sacked. Uh, it wasn't that hard to, for Mark So did the Gospel writer put that Hold in? Hold this second. I, I, let me get uh, real quickly uh, yeah, back yeah, here. So, and then, so and then uh, also, with, with respect to Paul being <coughs> killed in Rome, the first persecutions were Nero's in 64 B.C., which is uh, which is uh, excuse me, AD. 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 Yeah. which which is again before the uh, before uh, Vespasian and the destruction of the temple, etc. So again, it stands to reason that he died before the destruction of the temple. That that was such a monumental thing; it's inconceivable that it, that it wouldn't be otherwise described. If, 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 if but doesn't it? Well, well, let's, let's get Owen real quickly. Yeah. No, I did a quick clarification. So we're, we're talking about two different things. The the date of Mark, I, I think, is likely. Uh, Post temple destruction. So post, yeah. You think post? Why? At, at Mark, after the temple is destroyed, because he's writing that the temple's destroyed. So we know he didn't prophesy it. It must have been written. So I, it, it, if we're going to do history, we have to ask what's most likely. Right. Okay. So if we're doing good history, the the mundane explanation is always, 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 always more likely than the miraculous one. That there so they were skeptics Jesus like, like in his right. Right. even yes. even New Testament but, scholars who were skeptics like Bart Ehrman put it put it earlier than that. So it, it and it could be earlier, but I think probably seventy. It, it, 
certainly, I, I think Ken's right. That's major. The second thing I want to say is, I, I don't want to. We're, we're, we're talking when we're talking about Josephus. We're talking about Luke Acts. Yeah. And, and I, I, I get a, a context. Is, so some of it might be why is it very important when you date it. it becomes very important as you're making arguments of, of what what is the source material, how much is this could be embellished. The, the, when you when you establish the dates and stuff are very important. And what I seem to be hearing, and maybe it's not from the same person. But it, 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 when it suits the case, then, then Mark was written early. Now it doesn't suit my case, so it has to be written after Josephus. And I just want to see some consistency. I'm not saying Mark, I'm saying Luke. We have clear evidence, uh, you know, when John's head was delivered. Right. Uh, in the, you're clear with that, right? Well, can't you see that Luke is written off Josephus? <coughs> oh, I, you know, I, again, I'm not. I wish this was my area of scholarship because okay. I, I just I can't weigh in strongly on okay. that particular point. There's significant. But no, I, I think and there's lots of disagreement on that. Yeah. There's significant I, I academic think, work on, on, on antiquities being a, a, a primary driver yes. for a lot of material acts. Antiquities is 93, therefore acts comes later. The question is Luke. Did, did Luke write to Theophilus uh, the first time before and then come back and write acts later? Uh, is it possible? Is it possible that the gospel itself predates Acts by some amount of time? I don't think we really know that. It, typically, we just refer to it as Luke Acts and assume it all came in at one two volume work. We don't know. Uh, but I, I clearly, when we look at Acts, the, the scholarship here is substantial, and I hate to go to Robert Price because I'm not a mythicist. <laughs> but the work that he did unpacking Acts is extraordinary, and I, I, it, it, it seems to me like it's slam dunk. So, so James, so, James, you had raised this whole point of the dating in the context of uh, Jesus' prediction of returning in that generation and how would it make sense that the authors well, they actually write late. The prediction of the destruction of the temple is what okay. I was talking about. Okay, okay. Uh, so, so it seems to me, and this was the point in his end note here, that um, it's based on a presupposition that Jesus we know could not have known the future or predicted the temple being destroyed. And so, therefore, if the predictions in there it has to be dated after the fact and backdated. Uh, so, but I mean, say even even recognized false prophets that I don't think are inspired at all. Joseph Smith can occasionally get prophecies in advance, like the Civil War prophecy. Right. Yeah. You can yeah. get some right. So I don't. And I, don't I think, think that's that, why mainstream scholars would say that that the uh, that Mark could have been written in this, you know. 65 to 70 AD is because the handwriting was on the wall. The temple right. was sure. About but see, here's story. the thing: uh, Joseph Smith said uh, the temple would be built in Independence, Missouri. They had actually bought the land and they kicked them out. Uh, and then the prophets is problematic because the prophets said, "Oh my gosh, there's still some people remaining." So even they uh, were still expecting uh, the temple to be built. It wasn't built. Clearly, Joseph Smith is a false prophet. But Jesus gets a pass. When he says, you won't go through all the towns of, Jeru of Judea before the man of son comes in glory. Didn't happen. Man of son? That's a new one. Huh? Man, man of son. Man of son. He's speaking to you. So, I mean, clearly that is a false prophecy, right? Why does, why does Jesus get a pass and Joseph Smith doesn't? We've talked about that before. Well, so that was let's try to stick on the topic so we don't we don't chase all the rabbits well, on that. I th one question I want to ask, and, and people weigh in if they want to, is how early would you date, for example, Paul's writings, and especially how early would you date the Creed in First Corinthians fifteen through six? So the Creed is clearly early. Even even a guy like Richard Carrier, and yeah. he's way out there on the edge, right. will agree that there's no way around it. The you said that, for, we didn't. The ev so you're right. <laughs> I, the, evidence for the, the evidence for an early creed is substantial. I, even as an atheist, I'll accept that. What that means, we can debate that. Uh, Paul, I think, is writing between about 49 15. and about 59. About, about, about a 10 year period. Maybe, maybe as late as 59. Um, I, don't, I don't want to change well, that. Thessalonians is the first letter by Paul. And even there, he's telling them, hey, don't quit your day jobs. He, being a follower of Jesus, right. caught that apocalyptic notion mm -hmm. and believed Jesus was coming very soon. We who yeah. are alive and remain will be caught up. Right. Thank you. Wow. you know, okay. I would really like to stick to the, the text oh, here, what we're doing. Yeah, Scott we're, had a question back here. Because we're getting into stuff yeah, okay, that you right, didn't, right. didn't write about okay, that, at all. Scott, you have some forward? Yeah, uh, so I was going to ask you, um, just regarding even the, the conversation over the resurrection and the, the hypothesis we're even willing to consider, uh, since your primary area is epistemology, I mean, what, what role do you think background evidence has to do with the historical context 
has to do with answering that kind of question, or even allowing certain hypotheses to be reasonable to consider? Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, hugely, yeah, of course. Um, and that, that came in with the peer, epistemic peer that you know, uh, issue that we, we all do bring a, an awful lot of, um, I mean, an awful lot. We, we bring massive amounts of things to the table when we consider theses. That's why I say none of this is neat and clean, and that's why I love this kind of thing, because all of us with different views and different backgrounds can come and share ideas and, uh, and that kind of a thing. But, um, but yeah, there's definitely, there's no doubt, I mean, most will even admit to it uh, at the front end will say there's a kind of anti-supernatural bias when they come to believing these things. And so my own view with that is we've got to get that issue figured out before we start saying, uh, you know, this passage can't be historical. It's got to be interpolation because it's got a miraculous element to it. Um, but in order to get that issue figured out, I think we need to get the God issue figured out, whether or not we believe in God. Because the only reason I believe in miracles is because I believe in God. I mean, that, that's, that's the proper progression here. So I wouldn't expect somebody who's an atheist to be wide open to miracles. And I would in some ways expect an atheist to read the text and say, that can't be historical because it's got supernatural. But, elements. you know, Dave, since David Hume, we've known that uh, the least likely thing is a miracle. So it, it's much more believable to believe some uh, people had a, some gospel writers who had a theological axe grant grind made up Jesus walking on water. It, because it, billions of people walk on water, they know or get in water, and they don't, they drown. They don't the, the, walk the on water. The very nature of miracles is if it happened every day, it wouldn't be a miracle. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so it yeah. has to be extremely rare to even be considered in the classification of a miracle. Hey, but, uh, Bill, can I just point out something? Sure. Chris was trying to say earlier that Occam's razor is not necessarily the explanation, but now you're invoking it. I, I think we're kind of flip-flopping on our principles here, right? I mean, is the simplest explanation not, always the best explanation or not? It's not a question of simple, it's a question of likely. When we're doing history, the, 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 the historic, if we're doing good, true history, the question is, what is the most Thank likely you. explanation that we're going to And here's at? the thing, and, the Gospel of Peter, Peter's resurrecting fish. I mean, you had... <laughs> This is, read it. I mean, it's let, just let nuts. Let me make a parallel of a, of a very... Uh, so why is that true on the other side? A yeah. very improbable situation, but not necessarily supernatural, but very, very improbable. If you were on a commission uh, for the study of UFOs, a government a government um, uh, fact-finding commission, you were going to, you're to investigate this, and we want to know, did it likely happen? And if you say, I don't have to get out of the car, because I know aliens are very highly improbable, therefore I really don't need to go interview anybody. Uh, well, your bias has, has made you not able to do your job. Now, I, I would admit, I don't, I don't believe in aliens, and I'm thinking if you, if you do your job right, you're going to come up with the conclusion it wasn't aliens. But you just, when you're trying to investigate an issue and you know a priori that it's not true, so I don't need to even think about it, I think that you, you can't, we can't really have a discussion, I don't think, about that, can we? So, I mean, not a, not a real good discussion, anyway. Let me just say, too, that when you say this is unlikely, um, the problem is that every event, I mean, literally every event, is in itself unlikely. So the fact that you're sitting here right now today, think of all the factors that had to figure in for that to be the case, makes it a radically unlikely event. When we do probability theory, uh, it's not just is this itself intrinsically likely or unlikely? You've got to figure in other factors in the prior probabilities are what's really crucial. And so that, what do the priors invoke? It's your presuppositions that you bring into your probability calculations. So what, what do we get, in, get to pack into that? If I get to pack into it that God exists, that God's interested in, I don't know, saving humanity and all those things, I got all this stuff packed in, then it actually might come out very likely right. that Jesus rose from the dead. Right. It's fascinating. So these sort of like, you know, categorical uh, probability statements. Uh, and by the way, uh, we don't know since Hume that miracles are in themselves intrinsically unlikely. In fact, most philosophers uh, have a very dim view of Hume's account there. Thank you. And there are many secular philosophers, I mean atheistic philosophers, 
who have who have shown that he just didn't have an understanding of probability theory the way in which we, it's been formulated uh, after Bayes. I read Pent and Dustin Edge. Chris is jumping at the bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, kind of building on that. Um, okay. e even even if uh, Hume is wrong about the inherent likeliness of miracles, um, hopefully we can agree that miracles, even even if they're possible and do happen, don't happen too too often. Okay. Yeah. So any given miracle report, um, like if someone were to report a miracle happening in some other church today. More than likely, it's probably not a miracle just by virtue that they're. No, they're I, I wouldn't grant that. I think that's too big of a, of a jump. So um, I would say, just as a, as a casual obser observation about the way in which nature works, I don't think that God typically in intervenes. Now, I don't think that that makes it therefore unlikely that God is intervening in, in a particular situation. That would all depend on what the prior probabilities and everything we figure into our our calculations is. You see what I mean? So frequency and, and unlikely uh, uh, or improbable are two very, are, aren't the same thing. Can, can I make a distinction though? Let, let me, Chris, let, what sorry. You, I think sorry. I cut you off. I'm sorry. I, I, I see your point. If, if we phrase it more like uh, not every um, action attributed to God is actually God. Would you agree okay. that broadly speaking? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay, <laughs> I want to I want to unpack a little bit the, the, this idea that everything we're doing is improbable. Okay, that there's a there's a difference between us talking about a historical figure and saying that a historical figure did something like write a letter, okay, versus that historical figure grabbed a broom and flew up into orbit around the moon and came back. There's a uh, difference. Of those th there's there's a difference. And, and likelihood of those two events, and and while it might be improbable not, that not that in their sheer like, you know, I, what actually happened given the possibilities. I'm so the I, I, I disagree. Your possibilities I, I, of what you could have done tonight. But there is a sense depends. in which there's two different. You may not be expressing it in a way that you agree with, okay. but I think you have everybody agrees that one is more likely than the other. In it a, is it is far more it, it is far more not, likely not, tonight. That I, I disagree. Okay. It's far more likely that I come to an atheist Christian book club than it is that I uh, levitate myself in my living room for an hour. Okay. Right. One is far, far, far more likely uh, purely because it's a mundane thing. But only than because of your prior probabilities that figure in. Right. That if you just talk about probability this way. The actual outcome over can, the possible outcome. Can we not? Can we not agree? The, can we not agree? It's here in this context that the prior probability of me levitating yeah, myself absolutely. in my living room is is substantially lower. Right. Okay. So if we can agree to that, then my then my statement stands as absolutely true. Which statement? I'm sorry. That that there is a significant difference in, in likelihood between me coming here to the book club tonight and me levitating myself in my living room. Okay. How are you classifying if, if miracles on the If we are careful about the category. term probability, and if we're talking about the priors as well as the evidence figuring in, right? So it, if, if there was enough evidence and we had various other uh, sort of presuppositions that would figure into that, somebody could work out a probability calculus where that wouldn't be. Okay. I mean, we can imagine... I mean, if we're just I, I can imagine someone who believes scenarios. in levitation... Right. right. Okay. Great. But as a, we don't have anything we can talk about unless we can agree that there's a difference between okay, one day events and point, extraordinary events that are not yeah, Monday. Okay. My point, though, is we need to talk about those issues first and get our priors and our sort of what we're bringing to the table nailed down first, and then no, no, we start no, making no. throwing out these sort of uh, haphazard uh, probability. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, over the last two years. We've talked about, well, all of the things we've talked about tonight, about 18 dozen times. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so, but it kind of, the reason that's applicable is your book is about truth, goodness, and beauty. We've talked truth and goodness to death, but I don't know that we've ever really talked about beauty in terms of the way y'all talk about it as a part of a metaphysics or an epistemological system. And so maybe here's an opportunity to talk about something a little bit different. Where do you be involved in metaphysics and epistemology? Uh,
theoretical virtues. Um, when you have a thesis uh, of trying to explain the world in some way or another, we typically are discussing truth and the, the reasonableness of that claim and so on, uh, but really all, all pointing at the truth of it. But uh, the ancients thought it, it really needed to be that truth, goodness, and beauty sort of like came together and, and you know, for, for everything that we should believe, it should be those three things that are pointing us there. So when it comes to um, our one's metaphysic, now again, it's not to say if it's beautiful, don't fall into this trap of, of reading me this. Say if it's beautiful, therefore it's true. Because again, I'm not, we're saying truth, goodness, and beauty are these separate sort of things. Um, I do think the Christian worldview, in a way, the, the, the metaphysic, the Christian metaphysic, is one that sees the world as with genuine beauty to it. And I don't mean by that just that it's pretty or that it's good looking. Um, I, I tell my students that you might like death metal, but that doesn't make it beautiful, Jim. <laughs> um, right? There's, there's certain features that, again, these are ancient philosophers that would, that would sort of pick out what it is to, for something to be beautiful. Uh, and I think that the Christian worldview does see the world in this way in which we see it as beautiful. And, and there's genuine beauty, there's genuine goodness, uh, and we think that there's reason to believe that it's true. So it, it kind of comes together on all of this. I do happen to think that the atheist uh, view of the world, get ready to jump on me, uh, is, is not uh, beautiful. Uh, I don't see, see it as, uh, it's, it's a brutal, hostile, uh, uh, you know, it's it's the um, what's the um, Thomas Hobbes saying? It's brut brutish, brutish, nice brutish, short. Nice and, short. Um, and without hope, and without genuine value and meaning, and so on. And so, when we're comparing the sort of beauty of the worldviews, uh, I, I find that interesting, at least. Well, can I say something? <clears throat> Please. Perhaps it's not. Perhaps some of us feel like that it's realistic. And that in uh -huh. itself is a form of beauty. That you don't need to believe in some miracle or some, you don't have to believe in that to still see beauty. Wait, it's where's the beauty? It's, it's that it accords with reality? Is yeah, that it's okay. reality, okay. that it's in the reality of the world. Uh, yeah. Charles Darwin, there is grandeur in this view of life. And I, 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 I see plenty of beauty. I, I, I look up at the stars at night and, <coughs> Sorry, and see I, I, the vastness of yeah. the cosmos, and I, I see nothing but amazing I beauty. Notion. I guess what I'm yeah. saying is, as a theoretical virtue, I'm saying that the worldview, I took it this was the question, was that the worldview is one that um, is, is beautiful in the sense that it, it, it provides for us hope and uh, value and, and those sorts of things. Um, whereas the atheists, and again, this is a, this thing that a lot of atheists I talk to readily concede and say, yeah, life is pretty terrible in, in various ways. Uh, it's not to say that the heavens aren't beautiful and that uh, you know that we don't find some things, but I think that's again pretty, and not necessarily beauty as a theoretical virtue. Wow, we, just we, the history of the book club, <laughs> uh, we we had the. Um, not God's type book, which uh, a, a statement that the author made uh, Broadway, uh, just in passing about it, about atheism. She's a former atheist, and she said it was a, a pessimistic view, and that created big shock waves here in the uh, kind of book club. So I would say not all of the atheists that are a part of our club would would, would agree that that uh, atheism is a uh, more pessimistic or um, the yeah, the but it tends to not point at, you know, uh, or, or let me say it this way, it tends to say that value and hope, like this sort of ultimate hope, is not just not a reality, right? I mean, that's, that's the tendency of an atheist position is to say moral values. Um, now, they, I think you can be an atheist and hold to these, but it, it sits a little odd with that worldview, and that's... There's a lot of people that, that work on these things. Uh, if I was an atheist, I would still hold on to moral values myself, but I would be a kind of moral Platonist of sorts that just say, they exist, I don't, I don't have an explanation for those things, uh, but they just do, in fact, 
exist. So you think that all the all the Christians have a higher level of morals than, no. than the atheists no, 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 do? No, no, no. Because you obviously haven't looked at some of the big mainstream churches. Right, no, I think Christians are often far less moralistic at all. Yeah, I think what he's talking about is the source of morality, not not can we recognize epistemologically, recognize what, what is moral and what's yeah, not. Yeah. I think all of us in the room, except for maybe a couple of us, have the ability to be able to recognize what's moral. But the question it becomes is the, the ontology of that, or where does this yeah. come from? And Why is there such a thing that's right and wrong? Let me just right apologize yes. for not making that clear. I'm not... I'm certainly not saying that. I'm, the question was about metaphysics. Okay. And so when we talk about how actually people live, that's a whole different story. And I think oftentimes I'm a little reticent to, to call the you know roofer that's got the little Christian fish because I'm just not sure how good, you know, how faithful they're going to be about <laughs> myself as a Christian. Yeah. And if they're Baptist, forget about it. No, <laughs> no, I, go ahead. I, I yeah. don't know that we can answer this tonight or if there even is an answer, but... It's really, I have a difficult, maybe I'm a hippie or something, but I have trouble imagining how just an evolved biological machine even has a concept. It's hard for me to imagine why why they write symphonies and things like this. I mean, really, if everything was just a survival imperative, I don't even know where this sense of beauty and creation <coughs> of beauty came from. That, that is a good, a good, good question. question. Sure. The, uh, especially the idea of music, where, where did that come yeah. from? And I think there's, I mean, there's theories out there to try to explain mm -hmm. it, but I haven't seen one that satisfies me. And, uh, you know, other things like, you know, when you see a puppy that's really cute, well, there's biological explanations for that, you know, the, the big eyes. And the, the, the mother then what sees it as cute and wants to take care of it. You know, it's sort of an imperative, you know. So there, there is, so there's some things that, that have more ready explanations from a, from a biological evolutionary perspective, and others that, that are more difficult, uh, you know. For, but but I always come back to well, marijuana. You, you smoke marijuana, and it gives you a high or whatever. We we listen to music. Not it gives me us, personally. Yeah. No, no. I mean, <laughs> yeah. so, so, it is important. so so I mean to say that okay, well, music gives us certain chords and certain melodies give us give us a rise. Well, maybe it's just. An accident like marijuana gives us a, a rise. Mm -hmm. Why can't they both be be true at the same time? I, I don't know. It's just very Does mysterious. this tie into the, the music? Tie into the beauty of the Christian worldview? There's tons of Christian music out there. How much atheistic music is there? <laughs> I mean, how? The, 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 like I mean, you have an old playlist. Okay, right? yeah, all, all I could think of was the Beatles song you mentioned. Yeah, that's that's that printed that I run out. John Lennon, you can throw out. And, yeah. <laughs> Somebody Very put religion. on the, the Bob and Beer <laughs> Consortium. Uh, I think it was actually um, uh, Julio. And he put two songs. He put Imagine by John Lennon. There's an atheist song for you. One. And then a Kansas song, Dust in the Wind. <coughs> Although, I think the Kansas singer didn't he become a Christian. So I don't know if that... Well, it's not that an atheist couldn't that, so. have beauty or music. It's oh, just where did that come from in the Why is anything spirit? perceived right. as beautiful is yeah. your question. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. I'm yeah. just a highly evolved ape, I'm just the latest when iteration I, of evolution. When I look at a beautiful woman... Driven by survival. Right. Like, when I look at a beautiful woman like my wife, I'm attracted to her because... You know, she's there's a symmetry about her, a certain you know, there's it, 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 it exudes <laughs> careful. You know, there's, there's, there's a reason there's a reason why males are attracted to females, right? But that's like you said on the yeah. other have a, a strictly biological. Yeah, yeah, evolution. certain ones do that's have, survival yeah. for sure. I, yeah. Yeah. You know that this idea that we look at something that's comforting, that's calming, that, that that's tranquil, there is it possible there's a selective advantage to having the, the capacity for your brain to to dial down a couple of notches and lower your blood pressure. I mean, it, th there are entirely plausible natural explanations right. for that. Well, if that but was true, why would we come here? But the fact that I don't have a specific answer right now off the cuff doesn't mean that there's not some true. explanation sure. for that. But, uh, but I acknowledge it's a great mystery, like music. I mean, that's always yeah. baffled me. Right. Yeah. But it, well, every worldview does have the things that are harder to explain. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that it's not true necessarily, but it's a good question. Yeah. And does any worldview have all the answers to every question? I saw a t-shirt once that had the chemical composition for dopamine and serotonin. And it said, technically, there's only two things in the world you like. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. If you look at it electrochemically, <laughs> like uh, the, they've actually done studies on someone who's feeling joy and love taking that signature, like electrochemical signature, and, and perfectly identified it as um, someone else eating large doses of chocolate. 
It's the exact same signature in the electrochemical in the part of your neocortex. That makes sense. You can go back to, to Travis's point, though. Jim, I think of, you know, it's been about a year ago or so, we were standing at the back door, and I think it was Parker was asking you, is there anything that bothers you? And you had said, well, it really bothers me to think that my life is just going to end. It was, I don't want to put yes. words in your mouth, but yes. it was something similar similar to that. I, I'm a, I'm, I wouldn't call it a fear. Yeah. I, it's very unfortunate that if I'm correct, no part of me lives on after death. Yes. Yeah. No, no, and, but I don't think that's but, true. I'm speaking on. I'm not a great ambassador for atheism right now, but that's just me. <laughs> but I think that plays a little bit into that whole issue of the issue of hope. You know, there's a certain beauty to hope, a hope that doesn't just come to a, an end. There is a certain beauty to not just Christianity, but other you know, metaphysical systems that believe in something that continues on beyond. Owen no said, I believe in something continuing on. That's there right. is a certain yeah. kind of heart issue for us. It's not just a head issue, it's kind of a both and. Yeah. That says, there just needs to be something that I yearn for that's beyond what I have. There's a meaning, there's a purpose, okay. there's a well, something that, 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 so that, that, that went a little over the line, but yeah, I was yeah. 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 I don't need an yeah. ultimate meaning. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhat. Tell me that. Okay. Uh, we're talking about Christian beauty and stuff like that. That's, I think, just a little a phrase somebody's throwing out. Um, atheist, uh, I believe, the person believes in um, equality for all, all people. Why? And especially for women, don't believe in slavery, things like that. Okay, here comes the morality argument. The same. We've already had the morality argument, so However, let's just skip that one. However, <laughs> when I hear about Christians and stuff like that, they're saying uh, women can't do this, women can't do that, women can't do this. And also there's slavery in the, in the Bible. And well, the Bible's clearly chauvinistic, like the feeding of the 5,000, they can't count it, 5,000 men, oh, it's a women and children, you know. And in Acts, you know, so many were converted, it's women and children. I'm trying to... Uh, I, that, is your, is your, is your, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, I mean, is that not... Is your beauty coming from a male perspective only, or is it from a female perspective, because I don't see the female perspective at all they in Christian. Don't count. Yeah, there, are, there are women that are Christians. <laughs> <laughs> More than men. More than that, yes, that, that, there must be some appeal there. But I, 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 before we, I didn't want to change gears too much. It's fascinating what Owen said. There is something, are you talking about something genetic that, that, that goes beyond uh, the brain? So Your DNA or what? So I, my, my wife and I uh, have elected not to have children, so in my case, no. But what I would say is uh, the impact that I make on the world, the good that I do, you know, I, I, a, a number of the atheists in the room will identify as secular humanists. I certainly claim that label proudly. And I see it as my role. One of my roles as a human being while I'm here is to leave the world a better place than I found it, to leave to leave future generations even more empowered than, than the present generation, uh, to add to, to the fund of knowledge and to the sense the, the, the shared human moral sense, and, and to to make relationships that are lasting and enduring, and and to leave positive influences on on, on, on the people who survive me. And I, and I think if I do all of those things, and there absolutely is something that will survive me when I'm gone. And, and I'll add that. I don't, you know, people ask me, I, I've been an atheist a long time now. I'm 46, and it's been almost 30 years I've been an atheist. Um, but uh, people ask me, do you, do, you wish, do you wish it were true? Do you wish it could be true that, that, that you could meet your, my, both of my parents are still living, but you could meet your grandparents again? Maybe if your wife precedes you in death, you could see her again. Yeah, I mean, I, I in a way, I kind of wish it were, but I also think that that wish kind of serves to emotionally stunt us and to prevent us from working through the grief while it's happening and to, to, to rely on others and, and let other relationships fill that void. Uh, so I think there's some harm that comes from it uh, as well. But I, I generally would say that, that yeah, the, the, if nothing else, the relationships and the impact that I make as a humanist will survive me. That's and, good and, that, and, that, and that motivates me to be the best human being I can be. I, I, pardon the pun. God knows I'm not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those of you that don't yeah. know, that's Owen Younger. He's half of a international public speaking, atheist public speaking duo that goes 
all over Canada as well. Yeah, so, Canada. so it is international. So they're invited to speak on a multitude of subjects. So um, that's the skeptical Texans. I just wow. skeptical Texans. And he goes to Sunday school to classes. Them. Basically, they're sick. to go to Sunday yeah. school classes. Try to help the deluded Christian. Oh, okay. No, no. <laughs> and the last thing is we have. You, that, that, that. The last thing we have like four minutes left. Uh, maybe if I don't know, this is a great time for Travis to like. Yeah, go ahead. Five facts. Oh, it is five facts. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Any closing? Uh, uh, oh, statements. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to believe it's almost over. Yeah, I thought we were just getting going. Uh, no, and, and again, I you know I, I just want you all to know that you know I, I I'm struggling with this too. I'm on a journey here too, and I'm I this book represents my beliefs, but you know there are some that I come to with, with clarity and, and I think quite uh, good, what I think are quite good arguments. Uh, and there's other things that I'm still, you know, working on myself. And so, uh, I, you know, I, get, I don't know if, it's, if I even need to say this with this group, but uh, I hope nothing came across as offensive or, no, not or putting you, you, down You've been the most gracious like that. Uh, uh, host that I, I think we've ever <laughs> had. You know, uh, to take all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> even when I say things like, the Christian worldview has, the, it, as a metaphysic, as a worldview, as a as a grounding for values and things like that. I think there's a kind of beauty to that. Uh, all I really mean by that is, is I think beauty requires intentionality. The, the idea that there is purpose, that there is a sort of uh, end goal, a teleology to these things. And by definition, atheist doesn't doesn't have that, right? Because there's not a uh, a consciousness or a person, uh, so to speak. A being uh, to provide that intentionality with the world, whereas in the Christian worldview there is, and so even as we struggle through uh, as a Christian, uh, you know, maybe we can talk about this. Actually, we're out of time. Sorry, uh, the problem of evil. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I'd be more comfortable probably with that than the, than the pictures and stuff. But um, right, we we confront that with hope as Christians. Thing, with the kind of teleology, with the kind of intentionality that comes into it. Now, is God just harming us and punishing us? I don't, I don't think so. But I think there is a, there is an end goal in mind. That um, there's an end goal to history, if you like. And that's for me that kind of that's that's brilliant for me. That's 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 moving to me. That's beautiful to me. And so then, packaging that along with what I think are. Good, you know, is good evidence, the philosophical evidence, the arguments that come up in the book, and, and many more besides those, uh, the histor historical evidence, um, and so on and so forth. I, I come out very satisfied believing and giving my life to Christianity, though, with many questions, with many things that I don't know exactly how to work out, and loving groups like this where we can do that together and, and I can be challenged on things, and I can say, "Yeah, you know, that's a good point," and I don't have a good answer. Let me think some more about that. That's, that's to me what this journey is all about. But I'm, I'm confident Christianity is true, uh, uh, right? In the sense that I've given my life to it for those reasons. But I'm, I'm way open to hearing what you guys have to think and, and being challenged on the way. I want to say thank you on behalf of all the club members for being here. And just as a reminder, uh, we're no, no book club next month in, in, in uh, July, and then we'll be back on Friday, August 2nd, and uh, Jim Hall will be uh, discussing his book, Pulling Back the Green Curtain. If you're a Prime Amazon member, you can get the Kindle for free. He's got some. Hold, hold one up here. Where did he go? Mm, I, I don't have any more. Someone who I gave it to. Okay. Yeah. There you go. James, this I did look him. I have Amazon Prime 366 for Kindle. It's the unlimited. Oh, really? Yeah, the uh, unlimited. Is unlimited is Okay, I'm sorry. All right. Yeah, okay. it's a subscription service. Um, anyway, uh, so we oh, have and so let, oh, let me also point out that it's written under Stephanie Chase there, so if you're looking for my author, that was back when I actually cared, because it's got a lot of anti-Islamic <laughs> so in there. This <laughs> author, <laughs> those of you that have the book, you're going to see some depictions of Muhammad. I care a little bit less now, but we don't have that much reach. I don't think I'm going to get a bomb in my mailbox, but that's why. Okay. So he, he did write under the pseudonym, so remember that. And well, I'll give you links, you know, like I always do, to be able to get access to the book. And then in addition to that, um, 
Travis will be back with us along with John Loftus. And after tonight, I'm thinking, wow, if we didn't have enough yeah. power work tonight, <laughs> you want to come back? Let's, get, let's get these two together and see what happens. Uh, and you've got two months now to become an expert on uh, on history and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for all that. So thank you again for being uh, part of the A1 History Christian Book Club. I really look all forward to all month to do this. I put way more time into this when I should be doing my real job, but uh, it's because I really didn't get a lot out of it. I love being challenged. I love being out of the echo zone, uh, the echo chamber for a while, and be able to hear things that that um, are, are either new to me or challenge me. I need that, and I'm sure that, uh, that I'm speaking for a lot of us that we say the same thing. Thanks so much. Have a great summer. We'll see you in August.